you just never know what your story is going to look like, you know, and, and a lot of us do get maybe this kind of general idea. Maybe we have a dream to do something. Maybe we have a dream to write. Maybe we have a dream to, to make music or, or do live events or whatever it is. And that, that, that um, process of uncovering um, where, you know, where your story takes off is actually really beautiful. We're a couple months into the new year now and you already may be struggling to keep your New Year's resolutions. Perhaps you set a goal to plot out your next novel or start your blog, and your vision for the project is starting to fade in the busyness of life. If so, this episode is here for the rescue. Hi, I'm Clarissa Mall, and welcome to The Writerly Life, brought to you by Hope Writers, the most encouraging place on the internet for writers to make progress. Here at The Writerly Life, we help you expand your creativity explore new techniques, and express your hope-filled words in a world that needs them. We'll help you learn to balance the art of writing with the business of publishing, and learn to hustle without losing heart. You have words, and your words matter. And as you write them, you can be you. Boldly, bravely, maybe even a little scared sometimes. You can be you in your writing life. Welcome to the show, friends. Lean in, grab a pen, let's chat. It's been said that a goal without a plan is just a dream. Well, here at Hope Writers, we believe your writing life doesn't need to be, in the words of Shakespeare, such stuff as dreams are made on. You want to make real, tangible progress towards your writing goals. You need a plan that works. Before you can determine how to reach your readers with your words of hope, it's important to have clarity about your message. In this episode, we'll talk about how to do just that. Our guest for today, author and podcaster Ryan Romeo, knows all about clarifying a vision. Author of Head in the Clouds, Feet on the Ground, a survival guide for creatives, visionaries, and dreamers, Ryan guides writers and other creatives into knowing their why and creating content that amplifies their message to the world. Lean in as Ryan tells us more in this Hope Writers Tuesday teaching with host Emily P. Freeman. So yes. one of our writers, um, Summer, because I knew that you were coming on, we talked, we shared with our writers last week. And so they had a chance to put some questions ahead of time. And yeah. Summer asked a good question. She said, when do you share your dreams with other people? I often struggle mm. to know when a dream is ready to share and find support and when it's still in need of shelter from me. Like, for example, yeah. figuring out <laughs> what it is and what it might look like. Yeah. I thought that this was a is, great question. That's a great question. And it's something that we're all, we all struggle with a little bit. Um, yeah. For me, I kind of go into, um, you know, like we hear, we hear from business leaders, this term called elevator pitch. And, and it's so funny. I talk in my book, the first two thirds are about laying a foundation, understanding the dream killers, the things like critics, the things like setbacks. I talk about the two times that I failed horribly before I met Shane and got out cry off the ground. These are all things that kind of speak into us. And the last section of the book is called start. Um, Cause I felt like once you lay this expectation, once you lay this foundation, then you can really start. And when I go into starting, I go for me, when I have a dream, the very first thing I do, I have, uh, I have a little notebook, like, like any good art student, I have a moleskin notebook. Um, and I write in it and I, I wake up in the morning sometimes and go, gosh, you know, it'd be so amazing. What if we did this? And I pull out my notebook and I write it down um, and I take some time to pray. And um, and I read this thing that you are, um, you're like 60% more likely, something like that, to accomplish something that you write down. So for me, I'm going, okay, number one, I'm going to write it down. Um, and And as you look at it, there's a little bit of accountability that happens because you write it down and you go, oh, I might read this later or somebody might find this and read it. You know, it's like that first fear barrier that we have to cross. Um, and so I'll write it down and then I will start asking myself some questions like, is there anything I can do right now to start this? Um, what do I need to start it? How much money is it going to take? Do I, if I don't know that, what kind of research, who do I need to talk to to understand this? Um, and I get it to the point where really I get it into an elevator pitch. So one page document is my rule. Um, I got to get it into one word document. I got to explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, if you followed, you know, Simon Sinek, you know, why you're doing is so what you're doing, what you're doing is so important. Mm -hmm. Not just, I want to write a book. 
well, why do you want to write a book? What do you want to write it about? Who do you want to write it to? Think through these kind of difficult questions as you're starting. Uh, write down why you're doing it, how long it's going to take. Give yourself some, you know, like, okay, this looks like this is a big dream. It might take me 18 months to get this off the ground. I'm just going to write that down. Um, and I get it into the place where if I talk to somebody who has the ability to take this dream off the ground, I am prepared. Yeah. And um, I'm ready to go, oh, man, if they go, geez, that sounds like an amazing dream. Do you have any more information about it? I could go, yeah. And I'll, <laughs> Matter of fact. And I've got all, yeah, I've got, and I've got a bunch of documents on my computer that I probably will never give to anybody. But I, I'll even go through the process of designing like a little logo for it. Like what? I go through the whole process, yes, so that I could slide it across the table and go, here's, here's what I want to do. And, um, and now cry for us, it took us four years to get to that point where we could slide that document across the table and say, here, Joel Houston from Hillsong United, this is what we want to do. And he goes, oh, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, it took us a while to get to that point, but we had to have it look so packaged because yeah. the more professional you're reaching, the more professional you have to look. So you're going after bigger people. Uh, You've got to make it look like super, like they're, they're, they're like attention to detail right. <laughs> is going to be huge. Yeah. So even designing a logo, even doing something like that. So I will kind of put it together. But a lot of us, when we're dreamers or we're writers, it's so hard. We, we tend to be a little long winded and we might go, oh, here's a five page word document. You know, people don't have time to do that. Um, they really don't. And so when you're sitting in front of someone important, you got to be able to give them something. They call it an elevator pitch because it's like, what would you say to somebody if you're riding with them in one elevator ride? You know, you got in the elevator with somebody important. Yeah. What would you tell them? Yeah. So that's how I do it. All right. Now, listen. Yes. That was so good. And I'm going to ask you a million questions about that. Because okay, good. Because here's the thing. Well, it's it's like a one page for a book. It's like, it's like mm -hmm. instead of sliding the whole book proposal across the table, you have a one page where it's like everything. But here's what I'm taking away from what you just said and what I hope the writers do too is that you had to treat this idea like a real thing before it ever became a real thing. It is so much harder to say less words than it is to say a whole lot of words. And I think people confuse yes. that sometimes. It's hard, it's like, what do I not say? That's the work. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have, yes. I have one more, two more things to say. One more question about this sure. idea of the one page thing. Um, can you give us like kind of an overview of the things that are on that page whenever you do that work? Yeah. So um, I always start with the why. So mm -hmm. that's really important. And so I go, why are we doing what we're doing? And so that's, I would say, whatever you've got going on, uh, there's a lot of people that desire to be an author out there. But why do you want to be an author? What kind of book do you want to write? Who are you writing to? Um, so write that stuff down, get it into a, like for me, I'll, I'll, if it's longer than three sentences, I think there's a problem with it. Um, I try to boil it down into about three sentences. Um, then I talk about timeline. So, um, why you're doing, how long is it going to take? Just throwing, throwing it out there. Um, a lot of people that you sit with book publishers, uh, event people, they're all at some point they're. They, they are business people. And I don't mean that in a discouraging, like disparaging sort of way. They're business people. And, and they've got a lot of people pitching a lot of ideas at them. They got to be able to digest it real quick and say, yeah, that like, seems like it makes sense or no. And so when you put a time frame on it, it helps people wrap their head around it. Like, okay, you want to do this huge tour, but you don't want to do it next month. <laughs> You're looking at it realistically thinking, okay, it's going to be about a year and a half or something like that, you know? Then I try to do the thing that always scares every creative, um, especially if it's like a big project, but how much will it cost? Um, when we're sitting with people that uh, that can that can say yay or nay to our idea, many times it sits in, at some point in front of somebody who goes, okay, well, how much is this thing gonna cost us? Like, I gotta figure out how much is it gonna cost us? Do we have a hope of making the, making the money back? That sort of thing. And I think, I mean, authors, a lot of times, we may not know how much something is going to cost, but even coming to the table saying, I understand you're investing money into me as an author and creating something for me. And I carry a sense of responsibility. I don't carry a sense of entitlement to that, of going, you're investing money in me and I get that and I'm honored by that. And I'm going to do everything I can in my uh, reach 
to uh, to to try to to try to sell books and uh, and there's that kind of fine line of of really understanding that. So when you get down to like, okay, how much is something going to cost? You may not even know that, but just even having that the idea of going, this is how we're going to get the word out. This is how I'm going to use my platforms to their fullest. That's the kind of stuff I think that most people at some point you're going to be sitting in front of somebody, and that is the thing that that you really need to have boiled down. A one page vision. <laughs> it sounds so simple. But Ryan's right. It's a lot of work. As you seek to clarify your vision for your next project, make sure you keep your reader in mind. If you're a writer who's working toward publication, you've probably heard about the importance of building your platform or your readership base. Those who read your work regularly via your blog, your newsletter, or social media posts. Building a platform can be one of the most challenging parts of the writing life, but it's a necessary one. And it, too, requires vision. Consider these helpful tips from another of our Hope Writers Tuesday teachers, acquisitions editor and author Jennifer Dukes-Lee. Number one, show up. To clarify your vision for engaging readers, start by deciding which platforms work for you and then show up regularly to serve your audience. Remember, the goal is to share a message, not strive constantly for publication. Readers aren't a number or a means to an end. They're real people who need your message. Number two, share. A vision built on competition will wear you down. So extend the table and share other writers' work on your social media platforms or in your newsletter. Collaboration like this helps develop a spirit of generosity, and it also helps provide great content to your readers without having to create every single piece. Platform building can quickly lead to burnout. By sharing quality content from fellow writers that complements your message, you can continue to serve your readers while allowing your work to grow slow, as Jennifer says. Number three, batch your work. Healthy visions require planning to avoid overwhelm. Many writers batch social media posts or emails to their readers on certain days of the week. This helps us avoid the trap of spending the valuable writing time we need for larger projects on less important work. Batch work helps us remain consistent in our content, which publishers find attractive in a future author. Publishers are more willing to take a chance on writers with a smaller platform when they consistently engage with their readers and regularly provide targeted content. Number four, rest. It's impossible to give our best to readers if we don't take a break from our work. We need to give ourselves permission to shut the computer at the end of the day, knowing we've done our best. When we have blocked time for our work on the calendar, we can return to it refreshed and ready to share more of our message from a place of ease rather than stress. A vision that will stand the test of time needs to be rooted in rest. Could your writing life use a little clarity of vision these days? If so, These simple steps may be the first movement toward determining what's most important for you. Choose one to focus on this week, or if you're ready, sit down and try to write a one-page vision for your latest writing project. These practical exercises will help you move your goals from dreams to actionable plans, helping you celebrate your progress and take your next right step. Let's hear from Ryan and Emily one more time. I think you have such good things to say about that uh, that voice that we hear in our heads or the voice that other people actually give voice to is yes. that voice of the critic. And I'm mm-hmm. curious, um, and I know our writers are, are often struggling with, with that voice, and I know there's different kinds of critics, but I, I just love it if you could give some insight or perspective on, you know, anytime you're tackling a dream or, or, or articulating it, to people, there's always a risk and there's yes. what feels like the threat of danger. So what would you say yeah. about that? Well, and I think it's, I, gosh, I talk a lot of in the book, there's a section called the critic and there is, there's, I, I talk about there's an external critic and there's the internal critic. Um, a lot of that internal critic may have started with an external critic, but we've kind of started to believe it inside of us. Um, and there are times too, I talk about, you know, going through being an art school uh, gosh, you have to get used to being critiqued all the time. And I've had some hard, hard teachers that just did not let me hide at mm-hmm. all. And they would critique it. And there were people like that in my life that um, I actually go, 
there are critics that you should listen to mm -hmm. and they may not package it well. Maybe they're mean about it. Maybe it like really stings the way that they say it, but you have to be able to, again, separate what you do and who you are a little bit to, to, to st take a step back and go, is what they're saying, is there some truth to it? Is there some ways that I can make my next attempt at this better? Mm -hmm. And we have to listen to that. And I, it makes us just confront, again, sort of like misaligned identity, this sort of like we're anchoring our identity into the wrong place. Yeah. And if you've anchored all your identity into your work and somebody says, this work is no good, what you hear is you're no good. That's right. What you, what, what, what you are, who you are, how you're made, you're no good. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. The things that you make are the things you make. You can make another one. I mean, I've, I, I started writing a different book before I started writing the Head in the Clouds book that probably nobody will ever read, but that's okay. It's on the cutting room floor. I, I critiqued it myself enough to the point where I'm like, okay, I think I need to do another book, you know, and that's okay. That just makes us like, I got into, I got to a book that for me was way better. I'm so glad that I dumped all my work on that other thing. Mm -hmm. But if my identity was in that old book idea, I would be crushed and I probably wouldn't have a book out right now. Yeah. And that is one of those things that we have to expect critics. You have to expect that people are going to come along and go, that's no good. And you have to be able to have that separation between what you do and who you are so that you could look at the critique and go, is there truth in it? Are there some ways that I could get better at my craft? And mm -hmm. a lot of times, especially if it's somebody that you respect, there is something you could get better at. Mm -hmm. And when I did, I, I was the creative director for Outcry. And so um, when I would create graphic design, I would send it to the head designer for Hillsong and the head designer for Passion. And I'd go, what do you guys think? And hitting send on that email was so hard <laughs> oh, and it never got easier. Yeah. And I will say this, um, feeling a little bit of insecurity about um, releasing something you made creatively is going to happen your whole life. Yeah. And that's okay. It just means that you made something that you care about. That's mm -hmm. all right. But you have to not let fear keep that on your, your, you know, on your desktop and your computer. You have to not let fear keep you from sharing that thing because you have to share it. You have to get it out. And then you got to hear the critiques and then you got to get better at it. If this episode was helpful to you, just imagine how helpful the entire hour long interview with Ryan Romeo would be. Every week, Hope Writers members have access to a new one-hour Tuesday teaching with agents, publishers, social media strategists, and authors like Ryan Romeo. Hope Writers helps you make progress in your writing life, whether you're writing blogs, or articles, on social media, or in a book. If you want to be serious about your words and your reader, we're here for you. For writing tips and encouragement, find us on Instagram at Hope Writers or at our public Facebook page, Hope Writers Community. Last, a final word from mathematician and philosopher Alan Turing. We can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. You don't need to have every step of your writing journey plotted out in advance. All you need is a clear vision for the work that lies before you. No doubt when you spend time thinking about your writing, you can see there's plenty there that can be done. As you clarify your vision, you'll continue to place your reader front and center, delivering words of hope to those who need to hear them. Thanks for listening, writer friend. As you step into this week, remember to keep writing. Your words matter. We can't wait to read them. If you found this episode of The Writerly Life helpful, be sure to hit subscribe and tell your friends. Rate and review the show and like and comment if you're tuning in on YouTube. Your reviews help others know you found the content helpful. See you next week.